So um, this is called CPU isolation again, because I already did the same talk like three years ago, but many things have changed since then. So um, what is CPU isolation to start with? Uh, this is uh, when you want to um, maximize the use of one CPU, like your task is running on it, and you want to be free of any noise, like you don't want other tasks to preempt yours, you don't want interrupt, you don't want anything, you just want the plain use of that CPU. So let's start with the presentations. So this is me. Actually, this is my slide. This is me. <laughs> and my slide. And, your and, and my dots. And this is my slide. Recursively, this is my slide. OK. I'm trying to mimic it again. Is it, does it look like me? Yes. With the belly? No? Don't try to picture that belly again. I'm watching you. OK. What? One more time? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so this time, uh, there is going to be more dots in this talk and uh, some colors as well. So there is an improvement. Uh, so, the kernel isolation first consists in getting rid of 17 years of added piled kernel noise. Like, the kernel is a service, and in order to perform that service, well, the kernel uses all sorts of tricks and sometimes asynchronous code. And uh, this asynchronous code tends to, well, pile up more and more. So this is what we want to get rid of, but at the same time, we want to still be able to use that service. So basically, it consists in have the cake and eat it too, right? And actually, quite often, it doesn't come for free. Like, you have costs, you have to do trade-offs if you want to use the plain CPU. And quite often, you have to sacrifice a lamp. We are going to talk about which lamp later. And yeah, the cake is a lie. So first, uh, the very first thing you want to take care of is tasks. How to isolate other tasks from yours. So the, for the, this API has been introduced several years ago. Uh, so it helps you define a set of CPU you want tasks to run on. Or you can use task set, which is the bash version, which uses this API. So for example, here we are isolating all tasks. We just move all of them to CPU zero, which is usually what I do when I want to isolate one CPU out of the rest. Uh, this API also works on unbound kernel threads. By unbound, I mean kernel threads that don't have specific affinity, which is kernel threads that are not pinned to one specific CPU. Um, except for work use. Of course, work use are special. Um, there used to be a time when Unbound work use were running on unbound threads, which you could move to some CPU, change the affinity. This is not the case anymore, like for 10 years already, I guess. Uh, so now you need to use Sisyphus if you want to isolate the work use. So there is this path. Sys device virtual work use CPU mask, and also some specific work use those uh, that have uh, that flag WQ sysfs like right back infinity band they all have their own uh, directory so you can also um, overwrite the CPU mask there but usually uh, w WQ sysfs uh, work use are also unbound ones so the first 
the first pass is usually enough if you want to isolate them. Um, now comes the hard part. Uh, per CPU, kernel threads cannot be affined. I mean, they are pinned to one CPU on purpose because they have specific work to do on those precise CPUs. So if you want to shut down those case threads or at least make them quiet, you have to handle that case by case. And there are lots of per CPU kernel threads. Uh, so if you want an exhaustive documentation, you can check this kernel per CPU case threads txt. Uh, it has been written by Paul McKinney, so it's very, very exhaustive. And uh, yeah, it talks about threaded interrupts, for example, case of RQD, RCU case threads. There are tons of RCU case threads. They are very interesting. Um, now, if you want to isolate your CPU, you also want to take care of the uh, low level part, which is RRQs. Uh, the easy part is to isolate the uh, unbound RRQs. So you can do that through procfs, like here, for example, we are isolating every, uh, finding every RRQs to CPU zero, as usual except for one, which is RRQ0. Uh, this one is special, at least on x86, but I think it's also the case on many architectures. Um, this is the timers, and timers are special. They deserve an entire chapter. So uh, this is very important. This is a uh, dive into um, uh, the low-level implementation of the timer interrupt, so I need to ask you to focus, because this becomes tricky. Uh, so we have, when, when RRQ0 fires, you, we enter into uh, the clock event code, which checks the handler, and that handler is different whether you have a uh, tick periodic kernel, or if you run a high-resolution uh, tick. Uh, no, timers kernel, or if you run a no hertz but low resolution timer. And actually, there are even two more of these handlers for uh, tick broadcasting, which is even, even more complicated. So here is um, an example for the periodic case. So when we run in periodic mode and in low resolution mode, the tick actually takes care of the HR timers, which are supposed to be the high resolution timers, but they are actually in low resolution mode. So this is very confusing. Um, the same also happen when you have no hertz on, but high resolution off again. So this is roughly the same. And the strict opposite happens when you have high resolution on, and uh, so the clock events calls the high resolution handler, which itself calls the tick. So here we have a high resolution timer calling the tick, and here we have the tick calling high resolution timer. This is very interesting. And actually, in the end, every of these, uh, all of these handlers end up to call the timer queue. So actually, none of this was relevant. I just found it was funny to display. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in the end, a fine RQ0 is completely irrelevant because this is a low level part of the timer handling. So you need to find them at a higher level. Um, like for tasks and RQs, we have unbound timers. So timers which are uh, not affined to any special CPUs. But we don't have a real interface to move those timers to a specific CPU, except if you use the domain isolation. So here this is uh, through CPU set. Uh, there is this uh, file called sked load balance, which, is, uh, which basically uh, um, isolates one 
set of CPUs from the domains. And the ISOL CPUs uh, kernel boot option does roughly the same. So this domain isolation will move the timers, but it's going to move everything, actually. The timers, the work use, the tasks. So most of the time, it helps you uh, isolate a CPU, but it doesn't isolate everything, actually. Uh, you still have to move the interrupt affinity, for example. Now comes the pin timer. And there are no general rule. It's the same as for per CPU uh, kernel threads. You have to handle them case by case. So you need to trace the high resolution timer and normal timer uh, expire entry. So this is the callback uh, calls. And check any of the timers that executed and check which one you need to care about. And um, I fear you need to, to look at the code in order to get rid of them. So here is a practical example. The watchdog high resolution timer. Um, this is the watchdog that checks polls on each of the CPUs to check if we have, if we are running into a soft lockup or a hard lockup. And it fires around like every eight seconds, but depends on the configurations. And you can actually overwrite that. So um, you can see here the handler, watchdog timer FN. And you can disable it on a subset of CPUs using uh, sysctl. So here, for example, sysctl kernel watchdog CPU mask equal one. So it's going to only enable the watchdog uh, timer on the CPU one, actually CPU zero. But you know, that's CPU max, so it's confusing. Or you can disable it entirely, but I wouldn't advise that because, um, well, often it's still useful to have at least one CPU where you check if there is a hard lockup. Because if, if it happens on one CPU, it happens on the others. It's not always the case, but uh, it's still interesting to have that debugging on the housekeeping CPU, for example, CPU zero where you cannot uh, isolate the, the things. Uh, there is another practical case that is really mean. Um, this is the clock source watchdog. This one fires every four seconds. Not everyone has it, so you need to check. Um, it means that your timestamp counter is unreliable. So check your CPU flags if you want to know if you have this timer running every four seconds. If you have that TSC reliable flag on your uh, uh, CPU info, that means that you are spared. And there is also an exception for GEOD LX, whatever this is, I don't know. I found that in the code, so. <laughs> and I fear there is no solution to get rid of that. Uh, you have to change your hardware and I don't know, buy some more modern box. TSC uh, unreliable means that something in your system changes the timestamp counter value, such as BIOSes, for example, and there is no way to know, actually, unless you really dig very deep into, into system tracing, maybe, I don't know. There is no way to know if your TSC is really reliable if you do not have the flag. So, yeah, there is no solution for that. But there is black magic, actually. So you can use the boot option TSC reliable to force things out. Uh, I do not advise it because, well, the result is very unpredictable. Uh, you might have some jumps sudden jumps on your TSC, and it's not going to be taken care of by the watchdog, clock event watchdog. So you can try, but at your own risk. I use it because I don't have production codes running, so this is only for testing, but beware. And now comes my favorite part. Uh, the timers, the pinned timers, have this specific one, the tick. Um, you know, this is that interrupt, clock interrupt that fires every 
once every, uh, no, 100 times to 1,000 times every second. This is the Hertz value, you know. Um, nowadays, you can stop it. This is called config no Hertz full, and many distros now enable it, at least uh, Suze and Red Hat, I think. Uh, I don't know about the others. Um, so basically, yeah, you slide from 100,000 Hertz to zero Hertz, but it doesn't come for, for free. Who? Uh, they said they Red Hat and Susie Stuart? Stuart. Yeah. You said Red Hat and Susie enable that. I thought it has a the default overhead because you have to check, or is it mm. uh, check the? I think it's, it, it's enabled, but not runtime enabled. So the config is on, but you need to pass the parameter no hertz full equal something in order to enable it on the boot. Okay, so it doesn't go yeah. through the paths of the uh, going back and forth from user space through the... Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, uh, by default, there is none of that. Okay. By default, the, the, yeah, by default, your CPU keeps the tick. You need to pass that yeah. kernel parameter to enable well, I thought there was still, we had that check in there, but I guess, well... Yeah, there is. I guess, we could, I guess we could enable it now anyway because piece of meltdown and everything. It, it well, there is a lot of overhead, so, yeah. <laughs> It's For example, static? those okay. overheads. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so it's static overhead, or it has a static uh, branch, probably. Static branches, yes. lots of them. <laughs> so may, maybe yeah. too many okay. static branches in the end, branch. that's <laughs> one big branch. Yeah, so the first overhead is the tick reprogramming, because actually, even if you uh, disable the tick, it might still fire from time to time if something requires it, like if you have some queued timer somewhere. Uh, and also on context switch, if you have POSIX CPU timers running. But really, this is a shame. If you enable no hertz full, you really don't want POSIX CPU timers anyway. So, um, and for the rest, there is a lot of kernel entry and exit overhead because we do not account the CPU time using the tick anymore. So we need to find another way. So we listen on kernel entry and exit and we compute the difference. So this is how we now compute the CPU time accounting. And this can be expensive. So it happens for every syscalls, for every exception such as page faults and RQs actually also, but it's not useful anymore. So I guess it's going to, to disappear. Um, now, there is some requirements. Only one task can run when you are in no hertz full mode because you need to tick if you have several tasks competing for one CPU because you need preemption uh, in order to maintain the, the timeshare on the CPU. So, yeah, this is a constraint, and also you need to avoid the kernel entries, not only for the overhead I just talked about, but also because there is a big risk to arm some asynchronous code in the kernel, such as timers, work use, and RCU also. So this kind of trouble can later interrupt your CPU and restart the tick, and yeah. Um, also, last constraint, you need to keep one CPU with the tick. This is what we call uh, housekeeping. Uh, yeah, this is the lamb you need to sacrifice in the end. Uh, usually we use CPU zero for that, but if you have a very large number of CPUs such as 1024, um, you might need to define one housekeeper per domain, per node. But actually, I never tried that myself, so there may be lots of surprises if you try that. Uh, but this is something that we, we will need to handle in the long term. Um, that housekeeping <laughs> is also useful to move all the unbound and offline work, like timers, work use, like we talked about. And it's also there to handle the timekeeping, which is uh, the um, maintenance of G fees and get time of day uh, timestamps. And there is that 
very last one hertz mosquito. So uh, a few months ago, we still had one hertz because the scheduler needs to maintain its own internal values because it's not yet resilient to no tick at all. So we still needed that tick once per second. We call that one hertz. And now for a few months, we managed to move that uh, last tick to the housekeeper. But that housekeeper handles that remotely for all other CPUs. So it's like everyone in a house has one mosquito in their ear pulling uh, every second, and you move all those mosquitoes to the housekeeper, and that's great, exactly what you wanted, but it's still annoying. And of course, the cake is a lie, as you just realized, I guess. Uh, now about synchronous kernel codes, this is probably the um, easiest part. Uh, of course, syscalls invoke kernel service, which in turn can raise asynchronous code. Um, therefore, you need to avoid them if you want to keep the tick out of the CPU, and uh, if you want to avoid starting some per CPU asynchronous code. Uh, some people even try to get rid of using syscalls by re-implementing some kernel services. For example, the TCP, I think there is a, a user space TCP stack. I think the primary use is not to, to avoid syscalls, it's just to um, well, optimize the use of, uh, of uh, networking. But this could be an example. Uh, exceptions, so this is mostly about page faults. Um, you really need to avoid page faults because they uh, make you enter into the kernel and they can start some whatever kernel threads. So you need to use mlock in order to um, lock a specific area in memory and avoid it to be paged. And also, of course, you need to avoid ptrace. But who use ptrace on uh, bare metal uh, workloads anyway? So. Now for the future, um, well, as you just saw, the interface is scattered all around. We have, uh, we need to use a task set, for example, to isolate the tasks. We need to use SysFS in order to uh, isolate the work use, uh, SysCTL for other things, and so this is all big mess. And the best would be to have a unified configuration to isolate, plain isolate a CPU. I had a miserable try with extending ISOL CPUs um, because the NoHertz fool was yet another one of these configuration uh, ways. So um, I wanted to reuse that ISOL CPU thing, but this is uh, being obsolete. So. Um, the best actually would be to use CPU set because we already have that scheduled balance file which, uh, which can isolate from tasks and timer. And well, we would like to extend that to also isolate tasks, work queue, timers, um, our queues as well, and uh, try to get rid of all the per CPU specific feature that make some noise on the CPU. Uh, yeah, and also no hurts. Would be nice to to uh, to be handled that way as well. Uh, also, it would be nice to have ISOL CPUs to be modifiable. So this uh, kernel um, boot option, once you set it on the boot, it's not modifiable afterward. So you have to live with those CPU isolated for the rest of your life if you never reboot your box, of course. Uh, so it would be nice to have it modifiable through CPU set scheduled balance because they both do the same in the end. Um, the only way I, I see is to have a mount point somewhere called ISOL CPUs, mount, mount point uh, for CPU set, of course. So, yeah, and I don't have other things in mind, so. Questions?
Okay. <laughs> okay. We tried to use this, this uh, ISO, uh, ISO CPUs in one of our projects, mm -hmm. uh, and we managed to do that. The, the core was isolated. The processes which we want on that particular core, we, use, we, we, we could move it to that core by using task set. But then there was one particular process which we want to, want to be on all the cores, including on that core. That you want to do what with that process? One process, uh -huh. one particular process. Yep. We want, want it to be on all the cores. Okay. okay. So when, when we are doing that, that on uh, the using task set on that particular process, we notice mm -hmm. that that process is never going to that core which is isolated. Yeah. So is that a normal behavior or is it just... This is a normal behavior. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, because that domain has been completely isolated. I mean, that CPU, uh, it's null. Like, this is a null domain. So when you uh, define for one specific task, you, you, you assign it to any other CPU than this null domain, the scheduler is going to pick one of these uh, uh, CPUs that are on regular domains. Okay. So it's going to move on that null domains only if you <coughs> specify uh, an, af an affinity to this, only to this CPU. Understand? I don't know so if only to this, this one. So I, yeah. I, so I cannot make a process work on all the four, all, all, the, all, all the other cores, all, including no. this one. No. All right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, so over time, I mean, within the last decade, we gained all these amazing interfaces like high resolution timers and actually make use of modern hardware. Why do we still carry jiffies and ticks around at mm. all? Well, the ticks does way too many things. This is like the Swiss Army knife timer for everything. So, and especially for the scheduler internal use, we still need to have that. But you, we need to rework the scheduler code to make it really resilient to that. Well, also, you want, we want schedulers to be more flexible than yeah, on tick basis exactly. anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to have them actually be more sophisticated regarding their scheduling time. And what mm -hmm. I would rather assume is that you would want to have something similar to the uh, Apple scheduling APIs where you can say, I want to have a timer that should fire in 10 milliseconds plus minus two. Mm -hmm. And then you can just gobble all well, of those together later on. this is HR tick. There is a high resolution tick uh, internal to the scheduler and you can use that, but I think it has some overheads because it needs to be reprogrammed right. when you do context switches. Hmm. So it's very costly. It's, it's performance. It's, it's exactly, that's yeah. it, the performance. The, uh, the timer wheel requires the tick basically and it's much faster. You could, the whole thing about timer wheel is basically it's great for ads, it's an O1, where mm -hmm. HR timers is O log n. Um, so it has a slight overhead for more than um, so many things. So right now the Jiffy is very, very, very quick. There is talk about trying to get rid of it, but there's still, until it becomes just as fast as what we have today, hmm. no one wants it. No one wants to do the change because they've looked at it. Thomas, is, Thomas Gleichner has been doing a lot of, he's, he's like, I would love yeah. to kill the Jiffy. But he has yet to been satisfied that with a solution that is still is the same performance as today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we could replace it by the timestamp counter, maybe we could, perhaps. But maybe it's not so fast as a variable fetch like we do for GFIS. Right, I don't know. that's a thing, reprogramming the clock. So right now, you have to, to reprogram the clock is expensive. Yeah. So that well, you, can, you can have periodic HR timers, and if you if you do the uh, timer timer triggers combination that I was explaining with them, what the Apple guys are doing now, um, which actually is a pretty smart thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm surprised we didn't have that before them. Uh, you basically don't, I mean, you, you basically have a virtual tick, but only for all the users that actually would make use of something periodically. Yeah. And then you just combine those together. Right. That and, uh, yeah. So you still would have something similar to a tick, it wouldn't be a tick. Right. And it could be much more dynamic on when it actually fires. It wouldn't have to be 100 hertz. It could be at random other times that just still periodically. Right? And actually, is our tick actually fired every tick now? I guess it is still. Yeah, we still have it fired. I think it's, it's, it's binary. It's either going to no hertz mode, which is an idle, or when you have only one CPU right, right, right. In, in full, uh, or it actually fires still at the tick rate, yeah which you don't have to do really, because yep. the, the scheduler combine. does want to schedule at specific times and not when the tick comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and everything else really, I mean, that's just accounting at the end of the day. Mm. 
Oh, yeah. I guess we're not going to solve it here. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's right. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, here, come you on. want American to throw? <laughs> so on the, on the one, one process limitation, um, that makes sense for the completely fair, kind of the default scheduling class. Is there anybody looking at the other scheduler classes? Or even say you could, if you only had a bunch of SCED FIFO tasks or something, you still wouldn't need a tick, right? Mm -hmm. Then you could have more than one process in some cases, which might also be a baby step towards yep. uh, weaning the scheduler off of the, the, the yep. tick for at least some classes. It's already the case, I mean, for no hertz full mode, we, uh, if, if we have a FIFO task somewhere, we can disable the tick even if there are some uh, fair class tasks in the background. So okay. we do that for deadline tasks also. As long as there is one priority task running that cannot be preempted by any other there you, you, you don't have a tick. And maybe we could do that on, on, on non no hertz full as well. Well, Perhaps I think that would be a nice step, yeah, indeed. Isn't the issue the fact that if anything that goes into the kernel, you need the tick? Uh, not for everything when you run into the kernel, but since entering the kernel often, yeah. Like RCU. Like RCU. RCU, once you go into the kernel, RCU wants that tick right. Yeah, exactly. So as long as you, if you stay in user space, and yes, I think we've talked about, because uh, I remember when we first talked about doing no hertz full, we, we did bring up that SCED FIFO tasks yep. is equivalent to a single task running, mm -hmm. because once a, if it's SCED FIFO, will not give up the CPU until it decides to give up the CPU. Yeah. So the thing with RCU is that RCU needs to pull on the CPU to check when, whether we have quiescent states to report. And I don't know, maybe we could do that with context switches, maybe. I don't know. I thought Paul did some work to move the RCU housekeeping to the, uh, to the, single, to the housekeeping CPU as well. Like, but you cannot do that remotely, like checking uh, the quiescent state for a specific CPU. You cannot do that remotely, I guess. Yeah, there's the, more than just housekeeping. It's racy. I guess. Yeah, I think there's two things. There's like the check and then there's the housekeeping that does the work. The work is done remotely, but the, oh, the, yeah. the, count, the actual counts are on the actual yeah. CPU. Mm. Right. Okay. That's it. Yep. Thank you.